This is a BMW i3, which is a little egg-shaped electric hatchback from BMW with just 170 horsepower and a range of only 97 miles on its electric motor, or about 150 miles if you add in the range-extending gasoline engine like this one has. For the privilege of owning this vehicle, BMW charges a base price of $50,000. They shouldn't. Now, I rented this i3 with its plasti dipped blue wheels here in Atlanta at Hartsfield Jackson International Airport using Turo, which is this service that lets you rent out other people's cool and interesting cars like this one instead of normal, boring airport rental cars. You can sign up for Turo using the link in the description below and get $25 off your first rental. And you can also check out the link to Turo's app in the description. In today's video, I'm going to focus on why this car isn't worth $50,000. In fact, $50,000 grand is just where it starts. Equip this car with all the options and you'll get a sticker price of $62,000 for this little electric hatchback. Now I admit nobody's paying $62,000. The U.S. federal government has a $7,500 tax rebate for electric cars like this one, which lowers the price, and BMW dealers are aggressively pushing discounts to get these things out the door. But still, somewhere along the line, someone at BMW looked at this car and said, that little egg-shaped electric hatchback? Yeah, let's price that right below the M3. The main reason this is a problem is the competition. Consider this, the Tesla Model 3 has more than double the range of the BMW i3, and yet it starts $8,000 cheaper. The new Nissan Leaf will go 151 miles on a single charge. That's 54 miles more than the i3, and yet its base price is $15,000 cheaper. The i3 just isn't worth what BMW is asking for it, and that's proven on the used market. Right now, as I record this, there are hundreds of used i3s on Honor Trader for less than $20,000, some with clean tiles, low miles, as low as $13,000. It's got to be the worst depreciation in the car business. But with all that said, I like the i3. I just don't think it's worth 50 grand. The styling has been polarizing to some, but I think it looks cool and modern and funky, and it's one of the few cars that still looks like a brand new model model four years after it came out. It's also loaded with cool quirks and interesting features. So today I'm going to show you all of them, then I'm going to get behind the wheel and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the i3, click the link below to visit autotrader.com oversteer, where I've also compiled a list of the cheapest electric cars currently listed for sale on Autotrader. Now, I'm going to start up front with a couple of interesting i3 quirks up here, starting with the BMW Kidney Grills. This car, like all BMWs, has these two front grills that everybody knows BMWs have, except in this car... They're fake. They're not real. This car doesn't have an engine up here, so it doesn't need a grill to allow air in, but because it's such a distinctive design element, BMW kept them. So they're there just to make it look like a BMW. Now, to really drive home the point that these grills are unnecessary, I should mention there's a trunk under here. Yes, this is a hatchback with a cargo area in back, but because all the electric motor stuff is sort of at the bottom of the car, the front space isn't used for that, and so they have a trunk under here. Now, the interesting thing about this trunk is, in order to access it, you push a little button in the driver's footwell, and then you fumble around with a little latch up here, like an engine in a normal car, and then the front trunk is open. It's not large, but you could carry some stuff up here if you can't fit it in the cargo area. Now, if you're into cars, you've seen a lot of i3s driving around, you'll probably wonder why this one says Electronaut on it. Well, it turns out Electronaut was a special edition of the very earliest i3s, and it includes some interesting features. For example, this one had fast charging capability, which was optional, and also had heated seats, and it came with blue license plate frames. Bet your car didn't come with blue license plate frames. It also came with a lot of badging. In addition to the Electronaut badge on the front grille, there's also an Electronaut badge on the front doors. If you open the doors, there's an Electronaut not badge on the door sill and then inside in the footwell between the driver and passenger seats there's another electronaut badge that says on it 
Hello, future. <laughs> Apparently, this must have been a big selling point back when the i3 came out. Oh, it's the future, and my card is saying hello to it. Next up, I want to talk about the body panels. Now, every time a new Tesla comes out, people walk up to the body panels with like a ruler, and they see if it lines up just perfectly. And if it doesn't, they say, oh, the quality control is terrible. You see all sorts of tweets and posts on the internet about this. But take a look at the body panels on this car, where the A-pillar meets the hood. There's a giant gap there. Now I think that's intentional, but just take a look at them. You can feel them and you can see it's kind of cheap looking and certainly cheap feeling and they don't really line up. I've heard so many complaints about Tesla body panels that were one millimeter off and yet I've never heard anyone mention this on the i3 and well maybe they should have. Next up another interesting quirk of the i3 just to make it especially clear that this isn't a typical BMW. This vehicle has some rather odd trim level names. You know what a normal car you choose between the LX or the EX or the SE and that gives you the features that you want. Well in this vehicle the trim levels are called Deca World, Mega World, Giga World and Terra World. So you don't just buy an i3 EX or an i3 LX, you buy an i3 Mega World. I guess it's supposed to be like kilobytes, gigabytes, megabytes, but it's very, very strange. Next up, we got to talk about the i3's tires, and in this view, you can clearly see why. Look at how narrow these tires are. I can get my thumb and my index finger completely around the entire tread of the tire. It's crazy. A normal car has like 225, 255 width tires. This thing has 155 width tires. Now, presumably, that's to aid in the range. The tires help it go a little bit further if they're narrower for whatever reason, but it's just crazy to look at. They really look like bicycle tires, and when they're turned like this, you can look in and you can see the inner workings of the suspension, and it barely looks like a real road-going automobile. These have to be the narrowest tires on any car available for sale right now. Next up, we got to talk turn signals. I've always kind of liked the i3's turn signals. I like how they look. They're sort of flush with this rear tailgate panel. They're integrated into this black design, and they complement the brake lights and make this car sort of look like it has eyes in the back. I've always thought it was a really cool look, but this is my favorite part. If you open the tailgate with the turn signals on, watch the bumper down here. Look at that, a second set of turn signals comes on. That's because the US federal government mandates that no turn signals can be on a movable piece of bodywork. So the moment you open up the tailgate and it becomes a movable piece of bodywork, the turn signals turn on down here so they can be on in a fixed position. Close the tailgate again, and then the turn signals go right back to their normal position. Now the odd thing is when you open the tailgate, the turn signals don't turn off on the tailgate. So they're going on in both places and they stay on even as the tailgate goes all the way up in the air. Right now it's signaling to the sky that we're turning. Now another item I like back here is the brake lights. They make this cool U shape below the turn signal. When you put them on, they look kind of cool. But maybe the most interesting thing about the brake lights is they come on even when you're not putting on the brakes. You see, like most electric cars, the i3 can primarily be driven with just one pedal. You drive along using the accelerator pedal, you push it like normal, but when you get off the accelerator, the car slows itself down way more quickly than a normal car. That's because it's trying to capture the kinetic energy to regenerate some of the electric motor and give you a little bit more charge. Now the crazy thing about this is you can be driving along, you get off the accelerator, the car slows itself so rapidly it automatically applies the brake lights without you actually putting on the brakes. Take a look at this. I'm going to drive by and get off the accelerator and I'm not going to press the brakes. Watch what happens. And speaking of the doors, let's be honest, they are basically the weirdest thing about the entire side profile of the i3. The front ones are normal enough, but then the window line does this weird kink where it goes down about two inches, and then you have the rear doors, which are only half sized, and they have no door handle. Well, here's the explanation for that. You open the front door, and then there's a little handle right here. You use that to open the rear door, so the rear doors can't open independently of the front doors. You gotta open the front door first and then the rear door. Now, there is a rear door just like this on both sides, not only on one side, like some pickups or like the Hyundai Veloster. And once you have it open like this, you can just climb on in to the back seats. And now I'm back here and I'm hanging out. Now, there's not a lot of room back here. As you can see, I, I can't even really get my foot 
fully onto the floor, although I guess if I moved up the front seat a little bit, I would be okay. Nonetheless, I could sit back here for a while. It wouldn't be tremendously comfortable, but it would be fine. The problem with the back seats is more the fact that it's a little claustrophobic back here. Obviously, there's not a lot of leg room, but the big issue is that the rear windows don't roll down. When you close this, you're just kind of stuck back here. You have to wait for the person in front to open the door before you can get out, and your windows are fixed in place. You can't actually put them down. Only the front windows in the i3 roll down. So if you're in the back, you're in the back. All right, now I'm inside the i3, and I have to say this interior is just about the most responsible I've ever been in. Not responsible because it's boring, but responsible because a lot of it is recycled and sustainable. Take a listen to some of these things BMW says. The interior door panel are made of Kinaf fibers, a member of the cotton family that is particularly sustainable. The dashboard, the wood dashboard, this car doesn't have it, but the cars that have it, only eucalyptus wood is used, which is primarily grown in Europe and comes from 100% certified responsible forestry management. There's also wool in here that is a blend of wool and recycled plastic drink bottles. You don't get that in your typical everyday car. And all those materials make for kind of a different look. This car has a weird exterior look, and too often cars that look weird on the outside don't look weird enough on the inside. This car is just the right mix of odd exterior styling and unusual interior styling and materials. Now, one other interesting thing about the i3 while I'm sitting back here, with the doors open, you can clearly see the carbon fiber chassis and body structure of this vehicle. Now, usually I don't get into this stuff, but this is pretty cool. Usually only the top level exotic cars have carbon fiber in their chassis because it's very, very expensive and because it's a lightweight material that most normal cars simply don't need to utilize. But in this car, the theory was that the battery and electric motor components were so heavy, they wanted to sort of neutralize that and use a carbon chassis. So this thing has a carbon chassis like a Porsche Carrera GT and a LaFerrari and a 918 Spider and a $50,000 BMW electric hatchback. This is definitely the cheapest car to utilize such a thing. Next, it's time to climb into the front seats of the i3, but before I do, take a look at what happens when you approach this car at night. Press the unlock button and the interior lights turn blue to remind you you're approaching your futuristic BMW, but the instant you pull the door handle to get inside, they turn white, which is kind of a cool little touch. All right, now I'm inside the i3, and there are, of course, a bunch of interesting quirks in here, starting with simply turning it on. You press the start-stop button, and it makes a bit of an odd sound. Take a listen. I guess because this car doesn't have an engine sound when you start it, BMW wanted some sound to confirm that it was on, and so they chose that one, which is a little bit weird. Less weird is the gear lever. Now, you probably see it there, and you're like, what is that thing? And this is the first time I've ever driven an i3, and I've been wondering that same thing since I've seen it in pictures for the last four years, but it's oddly intuitive. It's mounted on the steering column, and you push it up to engage drive, simple enough, pull it down for reverse, also pretty easy, sort of give it a half push and you get neutral, and push a little button on top that engages park. It works pretty well, despite its unusual appearance. Something that doesn't quite work as well is the windshield wiper stock, which is just infuriating. You put on the windshield wipers, you move the stock to a certain position, high, low, whatever, the wipers turn on, all fine, and then the wiper stock goes back to its neutral position. So let's pretend you put the wipers on intermittent and the windshield is clean exactly how you want it and you think it's off because the stock is in the off position and then, well, they wipe your windshield. You weren't expecting it because you didn't realize the wipers were on intermittent. It is a terrible design. When I put the wipers on high, just leave the stock in the high position so I know they're there. Why complicate something that doesn't need to be complicated? And another odd choice by BMW in the interior of this car, when you're driving along at night, there's a little button below the hazard lights that shows an image of a car from the top and a little circle around it, sort of like a halo. It's very enticing. The circle is lit up in green, and it's sort of the only button that's lit so brightly like that, and you just you really want to push it. So you push it because you're curious, and then it turns off the forward collision warning system. Usually turning off that system is something that's buried deep in some menu, but in this car, it's like the 
most obvious and alluring button on the dashboard. Now, when you get inside the i3, your initial inclination is to pull the little part that juts out at the bottom, but that's actually a little storage tray. The grab handle you're supposed to pull is higher up, but I bet a lot of people make this mistake. Now, speaking of the storage tray, those storage trays inside the door are actually pretty big. You can get a water bottle in there and probably a lot of other stuff too. That's a cool little storage area, and it complements the glove box, which is also a little bit cool. In order to open it, you push a little button below the glove box, and then it immediately pops open, so you have access to your gloves. Another item I find interesting inside the i3's interior, it has a center console, like just about every car. It has controls for the infotainment system, the parking brake, and at the very front of the center console, there's a cup holder. Now, what did BMW do when they finished this center console? Why, they tacked on another cup holder that looks like a complete afterthought. Now, I have pulled this thing as hard as I could, but I don't think you can move it. It's like they were designing the center console, and they finished it, and then they are like, oh, you know, we probably need another cup holder, and so they just stuck it on there. Now, next up, one item that is worth noting about the i3, it is surprisingly low on equipment given its price point. This is an expensive car, as I've said several times, and yet it has manual seats. There's not a power function on the seats in this particular one. There's no sunroof in this vehicle. The tailgate is manual. It's not a power tailgate. In fact, this i3 doesn't even have a backup camera, which is now mandated by the government, but a couple years ago it wasn't, and BMW didn't put it in them. I guess it's a typical BMW when it comes to options, you gotta pay extra for everything. Now, in spite of having no backup camera, it does have one cool thing, shift it into reverse, and a little picture of an i3 comes on the center screen, and it lets you know if you're about to hit something. I do like that, it's a little bit more charming than a traditional car graphic. Finally, moving on to the infotainment system. This is actually a pretty standard BMW infotainment system. Under language, you can choose English, obviously, and a couple of other languages, but you can also choose short and normal. So you can listen to short English or normal English. Now, I've been speaking English for quite a while, and I personally have never heard of the difference between short and normal English, but well, I'm interested in finding out. And so those are the cool features and the weird quirks of the weird and quirky BMW i3. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the i3. You're pretty far away from me because the windshield is so sloped in this car. I actually like the driving position now. It does feel just a little bit minivan-y, but, uh, oh no, there's the car I wish I was driving. Uh, but other than that, I mean, it's actually kind of a nice driving position. You're sitting up high, and it, that people seem to like that based on the crossover craze. All right, now accelerating from a stop. Woo-wee! <laughs> it is quick uh, in terms of the acceleration. Because of the zero, the torque at zero RPM, it actually ends up being pretty quick, even though it's not really all that powerful. It does kind of jam you back, and it's kind of funny to see my head move back when I'm flooring it, and you can't hear the sound, but indeed, you know, it's, a, it's an electric car, and it's pretty quick. Sitting in a stoplight, it is completely quiet, and they've actually done a pretty good job of insulating uh, the car from the world outside. Um, you don't really hear all that much road noise from other vehicles or traffic noise or street noise or anything like that, which is surprising considering that this car has some economy car bits to it that really aren't the nice luxurious luxury car -like things you'd expect from you know a car at this price point. I personally think the materials are pretty cool. I've always liked that they like use like weird recycled materials and carbon neutral whatever, and, and it, it actually ends up being kind of a neat thing. There's no leather, it has sort of this weird uh, seat cushion material, the dashboard is a different material than everything else. I really uh, actually like how all that kind of fits together. It, it ends up being uh, cooler than I would expect. Around corners, the handling is surprisingly precise. So the second you start to turn the wheel, the car starts to do exactly what you'd expect. The handling itself, the way the car sort of feels when you go around a corner, uh, it's a little top heavy. Uh, it doesn't quite feel as sure-footed, especially because the ride and the handling can kind of get thrown off if you go over a bump. So if you hit like a mid-corner bump or something like that, uh, it can kind of feel a little bit on the shaky side. It certainly doesn't have the sort of stability that you've come to expect from BMWs. Nonetheless, between the acceleration and the handling, it's better than I think most people have come to expect from electric vehicles. Um, I I'm certainly believe that it's an improvement over most electric cars. I think Model 3 actually drives a little better better, uh, feels a little bit quicker, certainly has a lower center of gravity for better handling. The interior is very spacious. Um, I'm pretty tall, 6'3". I've got a ton of headroom, a uh, ton of legroom, um, the, the front passenger would as well. 
um, driving this car before I attempt the back seat, so I don't know how big they are, but I will say that sitting in front, the interior is quite on the spacious side. In the end, the driving experience I think is fine. I think the ride is a little bit rough and could be a little bit improved, uh, but I think generally speaking it's quick enough and it handles reasonably well, it's okay. Um, I think the main draw of this car will be its styling and sort of how weird it looks and how cool and weird the interior is. If you think it's cool, and I do, I mean I think it's futuristic and neat, uh, I just don't think 50 grand I could really justify. Why would I spend $50,000 on a car that I could only drive 97 miles uh, and still have to put gas in when I could theoretically spend 40 grand and get the Model 3 and have much better range or various other vehicles as well. Um, this car had a decent value proposition when it first came out three or four years ago, uh, but now it's totally outclassed and I think this is probably a very hard sell at BMW dealers and you shouldn't be buying one of these right now unless you can get a huge discount from BMW dealers because they know they're selling against much better competition in a rapidly uh, improving segment. And so that's the BMW i3. Say whatever you want, but this car is cool, at least in my opinion. I like how it looks. I like that it's weird and futuristic. I like all of its quirks, and frankly, I kind of like how it drives. The only thing I don't like about this car is the price, especially given the range. But considering how easy it is to find one of these used for under $20,000, this might just be the worst value new car that's also one of the coolest cheap used cars. And now now it's time to give it a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the i3 is controversial. I like it, but I know many feel the exact opposite. I'm giving it a 6 out of 10. Acceleration is in the high 6 second range, 0 to 60, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Handling is fine, acceptable, not quick or especially sharp, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Fun factor isn't too low, as it's exciting to drive and there's some novelty with the interior and the look, but it's still no sports car and it gets a 4 out of 10. Cool factor is still reasonably high as the i3 continues to turn heads, but it's getting pretty common and cheap, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Add it up and the weekend score is 21 out of 50. It's not much of a weekend car. As for the daily category, starting with features, the i3 is interesting. It has some good stuff, like some modern safety tech, but it's missing some obvious things like power seats and a backup camera. It gets just a 5 out of 10. Comfort is fine and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is good. I like the interior materials, but long-term reliability remains to be seen and it gets a 6 out of 10. Practicality is good. It's 36 plus cubic feet of cargo space should give it a 7 out of 10, but I'm knocking it down one point due to its low range, which makes it mostly an around town car, so it gets a 6 out of 10. Finally, there's value, and this is the low point. As a new car, the i3 is truly a terrible value, and it gets just a 2 out of 10, bringing the total daily score to a mere 25 out of 50. Add it up, and the Doug score is... 46 out of 100, compare that to the Model 3 and the Chevy Bolt, and you can see the i3 is just not anywhere near the shining star of this segment. I'd only get one of these if I was buying used or if I was getting a massive discount on a new lease or purchase.